My name is Brenna McFarland. This is Wednesday, November 16th, 2011, and we are in Salt Lake City interviewing Charlene Wells Hawks for the purposes of the Utah Women's Walk. Today we will be talking about Charlene's life and her contributions to the state of Utah. Tell me about where you were born, your family structure, and your early years growing up. Wow. <laughs> Let's see how we can start this. Um, I was born in Asuncion, Paraguay, um, the fifth of seven kids. Born in 1964. Wow, that's, that sounded like a long time ago now. Yeah. Um, but my dad was uh, working with Citibank at the time. And so we were living in Asuncion and uh, moved around, moved to Cordova, Argentina, then moved to Ecuador, then to Mexico. Uh, my dad was a mission president with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then we moved up to Salt Lake City for a few years. And then when I was 12, we moved back down to Santiago, Chile for six months. Uh, my mom homeschooled us for about six months then because we, we weren't quite sure if we were going to stay there for a little bit. And at the time, my dad was um, an ecclesiastical leader with the, with the Mormon Church, and he was the area authority over all the missions in the Southern Cone. And so then we moved over to Buenos Aires when I was 13, and I spent most of my teenage years in Buenos Aires, going to the American school there, Lincoln High School. And uh, my two younger sisters and I uh, were, were all there at the time with my parents. And then moved back up to Salt Lake City when I was middle of my junior year. That's a hard time to move. Uh, big culture shock coming to Utah, actually. I was used to friends from Argentina, from Israel, uh, Germany, all over the place, Iran. Uh, so then to come here to Utah, and everybody was blonde and blue-eyed. <laughs> and I just blended right in with everybody else. Um, and I went to Skyline High School for my, my final senior year and then went to um, probably one of the most exciting things that happened to me during, uh, during that time here in Utah was uh, when I went to Girl State, which is a program I really, really love, and learned all about uh, how our country works, our democracy, our systems, um, that, that really are the foundation of our freedoms. And uh, then was fortunate enough to be elected as Girls Nation Senator, and I got to be one of two, two gals that went back to Washington, D.C as part of Girls Nation, and uh, that was just such a great experience, and, and I think really laid the groundwork for what I'm doing today, um, the appreciation that I have for the freedoms that we have. And I went to BYU uh, after my sophomore year, took off a year as Miss America, and, and learned a lot, <laughs> 365 days on the road. And I came back and got my, my degree. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell for, for the young part. <laughs> okay. So what was it like growing up in South America, and how was it to go to school there? I loved it. You know, at the time when you're moving around a lot, and as a kid, you're thinking to yourself, do I really have to move again? Oh, no. But now in hindsight, what an incredible preparation time for me to learn how to adapt to change, and now I love change. I embrace change. In fact, if I'm not changing all the time, and everybody here at work, they're always saying, why are you changing everything all the time? And I go, I love change, because that means you're always, you're always striving to do new things and to find new adventures, new things about yourself, always trying to be better. Um, and, you know, as soon as you kind of stop changing, that's when you know, everything's just stagnant and boring. Uh, so I really learned a lot about uh, just embracing change by living in South America, moving around a lot. Um, I also lear learned to love diversity. I, you know, whether it's whether it's diversity in culture or in religion or just in preference of food or you know which movies you like, I love diversity, and so that's why my friends are just all across the board. They're all very different, um, and they come from very different backgrounds too. So growing up in South America was a huge blessing, and I always wanted to share that with my family. I wanted to live in South America again when I grew up, and it just it just didn't work out just because uh, with, with what my husband does for work, and, and he doesn't speak Spanish either, so, so I mean, th that wouldn't be helpful for him. But uh, I, I, I have made it uh, something very important for uh, our family to travel quite a bit um, for them growing up, because I wanted them to experience the different cultures. And, so, uh, but I loved growing up in South America. It was in, uh, just a wonderful place. My food and Argentina, every, every country is very different. Uh, but the Argentine food, I think, is probably my, my favorite. Okay, so besides Girls State, is there one experience from your early beginnings that you think prepared you for your life, work, or roles in life? Mm. Um, you know, especially with what I'm doing right now, 
living in Buenos Aires, my parents, my dad's from Nevada, my mom's from El Paso, Texas, and they're both very patriotic. My, I have four uncles who served in World War II and Korea and Vietnam, and my dad's a World War II veteran, and um, very, very patriotic. And one of the things that they used to do is every time we would go downtown Buenos Aires, we lived out in the suburbs, they would take the long way to get there if we were driving just so that we could pass by the U.S. Embassy and we could see the flag flying. That was just, it, it got us homesick just looking at the flag. And then, of course, looking at the men in uniform out there. <laughs> that was a great plus for us sisters <laughs> to be able to see those cute guys in uniform. And then with their patch, you know, the American patch there, to this day, I see men and women in uniform and I think of home. To me, they represent home, just seeing them in uniform. And so that, that's something that really, really stuck with me um, and made me very proud of our country. When you, when you grow up away from your country, you see it from far away. You see it on a pedestal, as it should be. And, and sometimes I think those, of, those who have grown up here kind of miss out on that perspective. They just are entrenched in it. This is the way it's always been. We've always had these freedoms. We've always had, and they don't have that comparison. So I think growing up away from the country really um, gave me an added perspective that I'm, I'm very, very grateful for. And today with the work that I do with military uh, is really um, just an extension of that because of, of the gratitude that I felt growing up, living away. Now it's like, you know, this is this is something that I am just excited to be part of, uh, to be able to preserve their legacy of service. Great. Um, who were the women you admired growing up, and how did they influence you? Great question. Um, especially at the time, because growing up uh, was a very strong um, transition time for women. You know, I was born in the '60s. I didn't really know anything other than women starting to do things that they had never done before, being in the workplace. So for me growing up, I would see women like Sandra Day O'Connor, first woman on the Supreme Court. I would see women like Elizabeth Dole, um, Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister of England. My goodness, she and Ronald Reagan stood shoulder to shoulder. And I would see these women and they were very strong, but not masculine which was a very distinct difference, to me anyway, because I would see these women, these feminists, who, you know, had to act one way and sound one way, and I thought, you know, that's not the way that I want to be. I want to be very strong, very powerful, but I don't want to be a guy, the way that I saw some of these feminists coming across. And so when I would see women like, like Margaret Thatcher, and, Elizabeth Dole is just beautiful, and she was so kind to me when I was uh, when I was Miss America. I went back to D.C., and uh, one of the first people that I got to meet with uh, was uh, Senator Dole, and and this was because of Senator Hatch. I'd been back there talking to him. And I said, "Oh, I'd really like to meet Elizabeth Dole," and Senator Hatch says, oh, "I can make that happen." And so he takes me over to Senator Dole's office, and and he says, "Oh, let me get her." At the time, she was on the cabinet with uh, with President Reagan, and he got her on the phone. And he gets off the phone, he says, she'll be here in about five minutes. She's coming from the White House to meet me. <laughs> it was just unbelievable. So I got to meet her firsthand. Um, I was just so impressed with her. And it was, it was those kind of women that I thought, you know what? They're making a difference. They're out there, but they're women, you know? And, and today, that's what I'm seeing. I'm really seeing everybody, more and more women that are saying, you know what? I want the family. The family is really what makes me happy. So let's see how we can blend everything else into that. And if it doesn't, you know, I went through a whole season of my life where I was at home primarily while the kids were little and everything. And they went off to school and I went, great, what am I doing during their school hours? So that's, you know, I learned from those kinds of women. My mom, you know, at the top of that list, my mom at the top of that list of being, you know, a strong woman who's very feminine. Um, she was a teacher and, and, you know, just was very involved with every, everything. So. It was a great time to grow up. Okay, so I know during junior high and high school you moved between Utah and South America. How did these transitions affect you? Um, well, as, as I think as I, as I mentioned before, that whole change, learning how to just love change instead of be fearful of change. Uh, I see too many people very fearful of change instead of 
embracing it like the grand adventure that it is. Um, so all, all those transitions really just help to um, shape the person that I am in terms of um, being a lot more outgoing. When I was a kid, I was not very outgoing at all. I was extremely shy. I was, a, I was definitely a wallflower. And it was because of all the moving around, especially through our, my teenage years, um, you just have to. You have to get out and say hi to people or, you know, or, or you're just really stuck. So that's uh, probably the biggest thing that I, I pulled from that. Okay. There's a lot written about your pageant experience, but looking back 26 years later, do you have a different perspective on the significance that Miss America had in your life? I've gone through different phases of appreciation for that time in my life. Um, the year immediately after Miss America, I went into hiding. <laughs> I wore a baseball cap everywhere. I was just so embarrassed about it because of all the stuff that I would see. And one of the first rules is you don't read the newspaper. But you know, I would, I would occasionally not see the cartoons done on me. And when you're in the public eye, that's what's going to happen. There's going to be cartoons about you. There's going to be differing opinions written about what you've said or how you looked or whatever. And, and I really thought that the majority of people saw the same way that, the, that those reporters or those cartoonists saw me. And so I hid for a year and, and nobody asked me out. So it was a very tough year socially. And so I thought, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? <laughs> I keep telling, my kids don't believe this. My <laughs> girls don't believe that I didn't go out on a date. In fact, in fact last, last week I was telling my, my two girls that are in college, I was telling them about something that I had just remembered, how I had been asked by a senior in high school, this is when I'm junior at BYU, right after Miss America year, he came and asked me to his prom at Provo High. I think it was Provo High. Yeah. And I said, yes. And my daughters are going, really? Why? And I go, nobody else was asking me out. <laughs> so I went to prom and I was 22 years old, you know, <laughs> but it was, it was a riot. I had a great time. But that year immediately afterwards, I was just, you know, I didn't know what to make of my experience. I was embarrassed. I, I was hiding. I didn't, nobody wanted to ask me out, so I just didn't know what to make of it. Um, then I started getting more involved with work. That's when I started getting involved with, um, with television. Uh, and, and I had, that year after Miss America, I did not want anything to do with television. So I had actually changed my major. I was going to go into international relations, didn't want anything to do with it. Then I got a job opportunity with, with KSL doing sideline and went, okay, I'll give it a shot, you know. And so then I ended up graduating in that. Um, and then when I got a job offer, actually when I went back to New York to interview with ESPN, um, this is after my three years of work doing sideline work with, with um, KSL, I went back there to, to interview and I left off Miss America off my resume because I just didn't know what they were going to think of that. You know, and, and there's just differing opinions. There is, you know, there's a, a perception out there of what somebody is like when they're in a pageant, which I didn't grow up knowing about because I was in South America and I never saw the pageant until I was in it. So it wasn't something that I was familiar with. But I left it off my resume and it wasn't until after I got hired that I said, I probably better disclose <laughs> to you what, what I did a couple of years ago. And I thought for sure they were going to fire me and they just laughed. So. Um, but it's really only been maybe the last five or ten years that I've come to embrace that, not as an embarrassment or as a liability, which sounds crazy, I know, but but when, when you've been on the working side of things and you hear a lot of that perception, um, it you know it tends to stick with you. But just in the last few years, I've been understanding it's not something that I go out and I go, by the way, at the top of my list here is this is what I did 26 years ago. But I, I actually put it at the bottom of my bio. It's just, you know, Charlene has four kids and they like to go skiing and she's a former Miss America. So it depends on, on you know, where it's, where it's going out. But um, one of the fun things is when I went to, uh, I went to Afghanistan a couple years ago and took uh, seven Miss Americas with me. And you know, because of my work, that I that I had those connections, and they invited us to go out, and just going around, meeting with the soldiers, and just saying thank you, even though we were a bunch of old Miss Americas, you know, it 
blew me away that they were appreciative of that. And they were just very excited to see a bunch of old Miss Americas over there. <laughs> I think they were just excited to see people reminded them of, I don't know, moms, grandmas. <laughs> there were a couple that were girlfriend stages. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was just pretty exciting. And I've been able to do some things with Miss America now um, the last few years where we bring in 20 wives and daughters of fallen heroes um, and we make them honorary Miss Americas. And so now that's become a part of me where I've really started to come back to the Miss America program and be able to use that experience to um, honor others, really. So it's it's been really interesting to see how I've gone through these phases of complete embarrassment to now it's like, you know, that was something I did a long time ago and it's okay, I've done a whole lot since, but you know, that that's okay. Okay, great. Tell me about your courtship, marriage, and family life now. Um, I met my husband in Sunday school at BYU, which was kind of the last place where I really thought I was going to find him. I don't know, I thought maybe New York or LA at the time, <laughs> I was crazy. Um, but I met him in Sunday school, he, uh, he offered me his seat uh, because it was a packed class, and I thought, oh, how nice of him. He's from St. Anthony, Idaho, the Bob is, and uh, he's the tenth of ten kids. And that night we were at a closing social for the semester, and I had never gone to these seats because I was, I was really avoiding all social stuff. This was at that, you know, still at the tail end of that, that post year. And we were both in the kitchen kind of helping out and avoiding people. And so we started talking and, and I thought he was going out with a friend of mine. So, cause she had told me a lot about him. And so afterwards I just said, hey, you know, if you don't want to date him anymore, you know, let me know. And a couple weeks later he called me up and our first date we went to go see the Christmas lights at Temple Square. And I just remember being so impressed with his um, level of confidence that didn't cross over into cockiness. It was, he was just very uh, comfortable in his own skin and he didn't try to impress me or anything. He wasn't trying to be over talkative. Or, and I just felt very, very safe and comfortable with him. And uh, about three dates later, no, 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 the second date, which was about a week later, he started telling me about more about his home in Idaho, and he, he said that he was going to go up there over Christmas. And I don't know why I was so forward, but I said, can I go? <laughs> and I'm sure he was like, you want to go home and meet my parents on our third date? Well, so I just thought it'd be funny. He was telling me how he, he, uh, they have a dog sled team. So I thought, oh, that'd be so much fun. So we went up there, and really I, I fell in love with his parents and with the with the whole beauty of Idaho, and he was all part of that. <laughs> so I just kind of fell in love with him right about then. I think it took him another two or three weeks <laughs> to realize that he was waiting for a missionary, actually. She was coming home about the same time that, that we started going out. Uh, but we got engaged um, March, uh, March 16th on my birthday. And so we went out mid-December, got engaged uh, shortly thereafter. We were actually talking marriage more about five weeks after we met. I know, but both of us were like, oh gosh, let's, <laughs> let's just keep this between us and then <laughs> let's do an official engagement. Uh, and then we got married um, in July, and uh, July 6th, and we've been married now 24 years. I know, oh my gosh, <laughs> I am so bad. I am the worst at remembering. He remembers a lot better than I do. And I'm always like, was it 24 or 25? Um, and then uh, um, we started having kids coming in 91. So that was, it was so fun. Um, our first, uh, Monica, she's now a junior at BYU in broadcast journalism. <laughs> and, uh, but, I, but I'm, I'm steering her. I'm like, you know what? Right after you get your broadcast, and, and she'll say, oh, mom, I already know this, but, but I really think she needs to get her MBA degree. Cause just based on everything that I've learned, you know, in today's world, you've just gotta be prepared for anything. So, um, and then my number two daughter, Nicole is up at, uh, BYU Idaho. She's studying animal science. And then my number three daughter is a sophomore at Beaumont, Sarah, and extremely talented. Boy, I don't, she's got a voice. I don't know where that one came from. I was always just this low alto and everything. She's got a soprano Broadway voice. She's just amazing. Um, and they're all bright, uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then my son came along. So, and then I've got a boy, he's 14. And uh, just, you know, that's really been the biggest achievement of my life is just being a mom. And I just have so much, and, and with every stage, I think they're the cutest and this is the best stage. And then we got to the teenage years and that's my favorite stage. 
<laughs> which totally surprised me. But it's been so much fun to get to know them as people and not just as little people that I had to boss around and change diapers and, you know, clean up messes and everything. Now they're, they're people, they're peers, they're, you know, I, I don't have to boss them around. Well, the last two I still have to boss around. <laughs> the other two are off on their own now. But they're so much fun. So what do you enjoy most about being a wife and mother? Um, boy, just number one, just the love and the fun. The, so so that's that's why I didn't like being a sergeant, is because it's like, oh guys, let me just have fun with being a mom. No, I gotta boss you around. Okay. So every time and and I say this all the time, um, when when they are doing stuff that they're not supposed to be doing, whether it's or they're not doing what, like if they're not practicing or if they're not studying or something. And I go, guys, let me have fun, please. You know, don't make me be such a bad guy. <laughs> and they go, oh, stop it. But uh, I, I just love the fun part. I love traveling with them. Um, I love seeing them discover new things about themselves. I love it when they share things with me. You know, we just, um, I, I see each one of them as being so much better than me. And, and even when, you know, they don't believe me sometimes, which just floors me because I go, you think I'm just making this up? That I'm telling you where you're so much better than I am? You know, because I'll see them sometimes at different times when they're not feeling as confident because they're going through teenage years. Everybody who goes through teenage years is gonna have those low times and they're not gonna feel good about themselves. Or, um, and, even, and, and even going through college, I went through all that, and so I try to share with them the times when I felt really low, and I go, and guys, I didn't even have half of the talent and the smarts that you guys have, and that's what's so fun. I love seeing them do things better than I did, and faster, and just, uh, it's just fun seeing them discover those talents, and just kind of sitting back and watching. <laughs> Um, so I know you told me a little bit earlier, but is there anything else you'd like to tell me about the business now, the Story Rock? Uh, I came to work for Story Rock as Chief Marketing Officer back in 2005. And at the time, we were just focused on schools, uh, working with their um, interactive yearbooks and really bringing them into the 21st century to uh, have the full multimedia uh, aspect of being able to document their, their lives in high school. Um, and it wasn't until, I think it was just a few months after that, that we, we got approached by um, the 96th Regional Readiness Command, which is a command in the Army Reserve based at Fort Douglas, and the commanding general had seen what we did with schools, and he said, can you help me out so that we can do something like that for my soldiers? I want to be able to thank them in a very substantive way and say, here's what you did. Here's who you served with. Here's the objectives that were met, the sacrifices that were made. And, I, and, and he says, I want to be able to give them each a copy of this. And, and at the time, I didn't know that this was something that had not been done before. So we were the really the first ones to be able to do this with the military, to help them um, document their service, not just so that it can go into some archives in a black hole somewhere at the Pentagon, but so that it can go down the chain and get into the hands of every single one of those soldiers and now sailors and airmen and marines um, and their families so they can share with their children and grandchildren what they did to preserve the freedoms of this nation because it's really less than one percent of our country serves in uniform less than one percent i mean that's amazing that we're able to that they are able to defend our borders like that and our freedoms um, so anyway that it has grown we went from working with the army reserve to uh and we were just a just another service of Story Rock. And then it grew into the Remember My Service division of Story Rock. And, and as we expanded and we, we started working with the Utah National Guard, and then it was Ohio National Guard, and then Wyoming, and Oklahoma, and North Carolina. Now we're working with half the National Guard from California to New York, Florida, Oklahoma, um, Guam, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, uh, all these different the commands that we're working with. Uh, working with the 3rd Infantry Division, with the Army, and it has just really expanded um, to the point that we're now a subsidiary of Story Rock. We've been able to break off as our own uh, company uh, under the umbrella of Story Rock. Um, and I've just gradually moved more into that position as, as just taking over uh, our growth as president of the Member My Service. 
and, and we've even grown now so that uh, our name is now RMS Productions uh, because of some of the things that we're uh, discussing right now with, with the Department of Defense on how we can help them out. Cool. Uh, what do you feel has been the most significant trial in your life? You know, as I look around me and at uh, my family members and friends who have gone through very serious trials, um, it's hard for me to say that I've gone through anything in comparison. Um, the last few years, uh, you know, we've had to just deal with um, a very serious disease that my husband has. And we've been very, very fortunate that, um, that he's been okay so far. And, uh, but you know, it, it will require, um, he has uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, which is of the liver, and he will require transplant at some point. And, We've gone now 12 years since his diagnosis, and they thought that it would be more like seven years when he would need the transplant. So the longer that we can put it off, the better our medicine is, the better, you know, and our doctors are fantastic. And so now it's not really, we've been living with it for a long time. Uh, you know, the first couple of years were very, very hard. In fact, um, it was when he was diagnosed that I decided I needed to go back and get my master's degree so that I could be fully prepared to be the primary breadwinner um, not sure, you know, what, because at the time I had left ESPN um, so that I could be a full-time mom. I was using my time at home writing books and writing music, but that's not really something that I can depend on as a career. And so I, I decided, you know what, I have to be fully prepared. So I went back, got my master's. Um, it took me four years, one class at a time, uh, while, while my kids were really little, just so I would go take a class and then come back. And then as soon as my youngest was in first grade, that's when I decided, okay, I'm gonna get back into full-time work so that I can choose. Because with education, you're able to choose more. I didn't want to just flip hamburgers. And believe it or not, that's probably what I'd be doing because at this age, you don't go back on camera <laughs> to do a whole lot of things on camera. And I didn't want to go back into you know, doing 6 a.m. news or something. I don't know, I just, it just wasn't something. I, and, and it was something I had always dreamed about being involved more in business and in marketing. And, and I think that's something that I'm pretty good at. So that's why I went back, got my master's in integrated marketing communications uh, at the University of Utah. So now I'm red and blue. <laughs> <laughs> I can ride the fence here in Utah. Uh, I can support everybody. And uh, that's when I started getting more involved and um, went to work with a, a company um, as a vice president of communications with Monavi, and then um, left there to come to Story Rock and just loved it ever since. So great people to work here. Uh, CEO John Lund is just amazing to work with. Our head of operations, Daryl Guyber. I mean, it's just a really fun place um, and a place where I'm allowed to just run with ideas. Um, in fact, one of the things that that uh, people tease me about, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but coming here, I feel like I'm an intrapreneur because I've just been given the free reign to really go after stuff and not be micromanaged at every turn and that's something that I realized that I really really needed so I didn't want to work in a big corporation where I would be micromanaged more likely um, so I really wanted to work in a small company but um, but in terms of, of the trials uh, you know and at, at first I really saw that as a huge trial you know living with something that you didn't know what was what your life was going to be like you know whether it was six months down the road or a year and now it's been 12 years you know living with it um, now it's it's turned into something that has made me stronger, made my family stronger. We're all better prepared for whatever, um, you know, and, and we all take better care of ourselves. And, and in fact, you know, because of uh, the, all the tests that my husband has to get routinely, we've all, uh, you know, been undergoing tests just so, because our doctor is just awesome. He, he wants to make sure everybody's really good and cancer free. And, um, you know, and then it, because of those tests, we found some things in one of my daughter that, that now, because we caught it so early, that she'll be fine. So, and, and had we not been going through these tests, you know, she wouldn't be. So, it's it's really been interesting to kind of go through things like that in life, and then as you look back at hindsight on how it just made you stronger. What would you like to be remembered for? Mm. Well, number one, being mom, mom and wife, because. Um, because those, those four kids are the, the best thing. Well, first my husband, because <laughs> he's an important part. Um, 
for my family. That's that's the number one thing. Um, and then and then as a patriot, um, you know, somebody that that highly that prizes my membership as a member of this country, um, higher than any other association that I'm part of. Um, being able to enjoy these kinds of freedoms, knowing how many people cannot have these freedoms, cannot even dream of the things that I dream of, because they just simply are not in in that kind of, uh, of situation, whether it's resources or whether it's the culture, or the educational background. So I, I have a very, very deep sense of gratitude for um, my, my citizenship in this country even though I was born in Paraguay. <laughs> um, it's funny because I've got a brother who's from, who was born in Paraguay, too, and, and we often joke about, you know, should we, get, should we get our dual citizenship? Should we have a passport just, you know, for the heck of it? And it's like, nah, we don't need to. <laughs> it's great to have this American passport. Um, and then, um, you know, being, um, having, having the faith that, I've, that I have and that I've grown up with, and, um, and then, you know, something that I picked up from my parents, um, the sense of adventure, and it just seems like everything can be an adventure, whether it's the trials, whether it's change. Um, I, I love new things, I, and everything just seems, every new day just seems like it brings a new adventure. Um, very rarely do I have a boring day. Uh, if, if I find myself having a boring day, it's like, wow, I'm going to enjoy this boring day. Because <laughs> very rarely is there one. Um, you know, and, and you go through stages in life. Uh, when the kids were the youngest, I would have to say that was my hardest time. Um, it is very hard being a mom of young kids. Um, and I had, let's see, when Jacob was born, Sarah was not quite two, so I had two-year-old, so I had four over the age of six. Um, I would say that that's probably been the hardest time of my life. Just not, not the least enjoyable. It was just the hardest because there's just so much chaos. <laughs> and you're always trying to stay on top of it. And you're also trying to stay sane, trying to still be your same person. So I think one of the best things that I ever did was going to school because that gave me, you know, taking those classes. So, um, and then uh, doing a little bit that I did on the side, writing a couple of books, writing some music. Uh, I would do some speaking here and there, just staying involved, getting me out of the house a little bit, um, helped me stay sane. <laughs> but it was all part of the adventure, all part of the adventure. So I guess, you know, those are some of the things to, to be remembered for. Um, uh, probably a lot of other crazy things that I'll be remembered for, but, <laughs> but those would be my favorites, I guess. What do you hope to accomplish or experience in the future? Oh, uh, you never know what's around the corner. Just because, I mean, now that I'm 47 years old, if you had told me when I was 18, even just 18, that Miss America would be on the horizon, I would have laughed at you. If you told me that ESPN was on the horizon, I would have laughed. If you told me I'd be working with the military, I'd be, really? What would I be doing? You know, so I never know what's around the corner. But as of right now, some adventures that I would love. Um, I'd love to represent our country again, maybe as an ambassador, ambassador to Argentina. You know, why not? I speak Spanish. <laughs> um, I would love to represent our state. I'm very proud of being in Utah. Very proud of this state. I'm outside of our state quite a bit. I travel quite a bit now. I'm in DC a lot. Um, and so I get to talk about why I'm proud about Utah, every now and then they'll ask me things like, why do you guys do caucuses back <laughs> And I have to go, <laughs> I don't know, so every now and there's some things, you know, that, that come up in the news and people will, will ask me about Utah. I'm very proud of our people. I'm, I'm proud of our industriousness. I'm, um, hold it, is that a word? No, <laughs> our industry. Um, I make up words all the time. My dad makes up words in Spanish. It's great. <laughs> oh, that's a good one, Dad. I love it. Um, I'm very proud of our uh, the diversity 
that we have, believe it or not, we have huge diversity here. It may not be in, in race. It might have not even be in culture, although in Salt Lake, I think we have a lot of diversity here. Um, but in terms of our, our geography, our, um, our abilities to, to get out and ski in the, in the afternoon, golf in the morning, uh, go to jazz game, the, the, the um, um, arts that we have here. I just love living here. So representing Utah at some point, whether it's you know in the state economic department or you know with sports, doesn't matter, but lots of different things that I'd love to still do. So what advice do you have for younger women in Utah? First of all, education, huge, huge. Don't underestimate the power of education. Uh, I'm, I'm still seeing a lot of young women getting married very, very young, and I'm talking 18, 19. That to me is very, very young. And then they forego their education. I thought in today's world, they wouldn't do that anymore. If, even if they get married young, okay, whatever you want to do, but, but still get educated because you don't know what's around the corner. You don't know if you're going to have to be the breadwinner for whatever reason. I, I know people who are very unhappy in their marriages for whatever reason, but they don't have an out because they are not educated enough to go find a job, whatever that job might be. If you're not educated, you don't have huge choices to get a job. Um, so for me, it's, you know what, get out there and educate yourself and have lots of experiences. Do the study abroad. Get a scholarship to go do a study abroad. Um, get internships. Do just a huge variety of things so you have more choices. Um, you know, it, it has been really, really interesting to still see um, these, these cute young girls getting married. But that's not the biggest thing for me. It's that they stop going to school. So that's, that's the one that ah, scares me. So fortunately, I got my, my girls that know that it's not an option. <laughs> if you want me to pay for your wedding, <laughs> you're going to keep going to school. <laughs> so. OK, um, Professor, do you have any other questions? If you have time, do you have time for two or three more? Yes. OK. Uh, one question I would like you to talk about is, is your Miss Utah experience? Um, what was that? Which like? was very Miss, short. Was it? Because, well, because that. I was Miss Utah, and then I went to Miss America two months later. So I didn't really spend a whole lot of time as Miss Utah. Um, I went around to a lot of events during that year, uh, but I don't really remember that time quite as much, just because I went straight to, to Miss America. Um, I remember being very surprised being Miss Utah. I was not, um, how old was I? Yeah, I was 20, I was 20. So um, it was something that I thought I was just gonna do for the summer. So it, it caught me off guard when, when um, I remember my mom when I was going back to Atlantic City and I was getting ready to put a deposit on my uh, apartment for BYU for the coming fall. And she said, uh, no, don't put a deposit down because you're not coming back, you know, you're, you're gonna be Miss America. And I'm going, <laughs> you're right, mom. <laughs> So yeah, I went ahead and put the deposit down, lost it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but as as Miss Utah, um, I was I was very proud of representing our state going back there. And then I, I you know I got a bucket of cold water thrown on me that first day going back and finding out that nobody was interested in talking to Miss Utah. You know why? Let's talk to Miss Texas. Let's talk to Miss Kentucky. Miss Mississippi. But Utah? What comes out of Utah? So. It was a lot of fun that year, you know, to, to be very proud about saying, yeah, I'm from, I'm from Utah, sort of. I grew up <laughs> all over the place, but if I'm going to claim one state, it's going to be Utah, so. How about more about your ESPN experience? What, what happened there? ESPN was so much fun. It was also one of the scariest times in my life because that whole time that I worked there, because it took me a good seven years, I would say, to get comfortable being on live television. I think I faked it okay, but um, live television was just so scary. I remember coming back from, I did five years, um, actually eight, eight years down on the sideline, Big Ten football. We did a couple of years on college game day. Um, but I remember coming back, maybe it was my 
my second year being on the sideline, and I had just had this horrific, embarrassing experience, kind of a Rick Perry moment. <laughs> you got to see that. Um, where I'm down on the sidelines, and it's in our open, the show open, they've just tossed down to me, and I'm you know, thinking of everything I'm gonna say, I've got a whole minute, the red light goes on, I'm starting to talk, and the band comes on the field right then, but they don't just go on the field behind me, oh no, they walk right in front of me, and the tuba player stops right there as I'm trying to concentrate, and I just totally lost concentration. I'm like, I have no clue what's in this brain. I don't know, you know. And I don't know how long it was before I could keep talking. I'm sure I kept talking on something. Afterwards, I called my mom in, during a break, because I always did that every time I totally flubbed it, because I knew that she would lie to me and say I did okay. <laughs> but I call her, Mom, did you see that? And she goes, well, you looked a little distracted for us just a little bit, and then you got right back onto it. And I went, really? It didn't look like I totally tanked? <laughs> and she was great. But I came home from that, just still, just don't ever put me on live TV, ever again, never again. And I told my husband, I would rather go through labor than go back on live television. And he says, you can't, you've got a contract. <laughs> you have to go back on TV. Um, but I just, I just hated it. The nerves made me so sick because I just knew how everything would just go wrong. Um, and so it took me a long time getting comfortable with it. And then I left after, so I was on contract for seven years. And um, at that point, I had my, my oldest daughter was two, and then my youngest daughter had just been born, and, and they wanted me to stay on contract, and I just couldn't. It was just too hard to, to be gone. You know, you're gonna be gone for four days here, and then two weeks from now, you're, you know, it was just way too hard. So I asked if I could go off contract, which, you know, when you're, when you're making quite a bit of money, and then you go from that to nothing, it's a little bit hard, but, but at the same time, it was just almost one of those no-brainers. You just, you know, I asked them if I could just do freelance. And so for the next nine years, I did some freelance work with them. Not a whole lot, but I kept doing Kentucky Derby, kept doing some, um, some different events here and there. They would call me and just ask if I could help out with features and that kind of thing. Um, and then when I came to work full-time here, I, I completely stopped. It was just, uh, it was impossible for me to be able to commit to them and, and here. So um, it was, it was unbelievable the variety of things that I got to do. Everything from, from nine years with Kentucky Derby, uh, doing a lot of um, the features there and interviewing with celebrities like Peyton Manning and Larry King and Donald Trump and some of those that would come through. Um, from, from that to the French Open, the World Alpine Championships to college football to World Lumberjack Championships. I mean, <laughs> I got to do log rolling. <laughs> so lots of really interesting things through the years. I was um, the third female to work at ESPN. Uh, so I was 23 years old when I went to work there. I was way too young to be working on national TV at that time, but they were really looking for females. <laughs> so I was in the right place at the right time. Um, and, and they had seen my work uh, doing three years of sideline for BYU. And, and at the time, 1987, not too many women in sports television. So they had slim pickings. Now it's they do some they do some really fine work. These women that are on. Um, so it's it's fun to see how how it has really evolved. And there's so many women on air now. Um, but at the time, that was um, I still felt like we were pioneering some new ground there to have women in sports television. I remember being at BYU and in my broadcast journalism classes and being told by the teachers, what are you thinking going into sports television? You know, A, women shouldn't be there. So they're telling me that. And B, it's just all fluff, it's just all fluff. Which, to a certain extent, yeah. But as we've seen in the last week or so, especially there's a lot of news happening in sports. <laughs> so, and, and the more that the cameras are on sports, the more news comes out of it. So it's, it's not all fluff. But I, I kind of enjoyed that part of it. I loved, my favorite part of working with ESPN was getting to know athletes and finding out what goes through their minds when they completely fail, when they just really blow a game, when you know they, they fall three times on the ice. You know, how do you pick yourself back up? And that was just phenomenal to get to know that side of champions. You know, and I'm talking to champions, talking about their failures. 
And more often than not, it was these champions that would say, it was because of those failures that I won. Today. It was because of everything that I learned from those failures that I am where I am now. So, you know, I, I just learned a lot from that. I loved finding out, you know, what you guys did right this time. What you did, you know, just all that part. And, and that was my niche at ESPN, um, was a lot of those features. In fact, the first, I remember at the end of the second year, I think it was, that the uh, president of ESPN asked me to make a list of all the things that I would like to work on. And ev I got to do everything in that list except one, and that was the Iditarod. I really wanted to cover the Iditarod, but we weren't doing a whole lot of coverage back then on the Iditarod, so I never got to do that. But, uh, but everything else, I mean, the French Open, and just it was, it was great fun as I look back on it. And uh, my kids are still kind of in disbelief that I actually worked with ESPN. Because, you know, there was a little, I don't remember, they'd have to go back and look at the VHS tapes you know, <laughs> to make sure that I really did work on ESPN. <laughs> But they, you know what, um, when, when College Game Day was at BYU last, uh, you know, my old friends still work on there. I mean, gosh, those guys, Chris Fowler's been there for a long time. And I worked with, with Chris and with Lee Corso and, and, and Kirk Herbstreit. I interviewed him when he was a player. So it was, it was fun. So I got to see them and I took my daughter on set. And that's when it really hit her. My mom really knows these people. <laughs> so it was great. And then they had her, they gave her a pass and they let her come on the set during the during the studio show. And so that was I got big points on that one. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun to work there, but I, I still remember the, the nerves of going on live TV that were really, really scary. Are you gonna ask about the words of wisdom or maxims that you've lived your life by? Any Probably ones? the big one. Um is one that I would keep on my, my wall growing up, and I just hand wrote it, you know? And it, I remember it was just kind of above my head there, and I, I just always saw it. Um, and I've changed the verbiage of, as I've gotten older, but, but it's pretty much this, that um, he who aims at excellence will achieve far above mediocrity. He who aims at mediocrity will fall far short of it. And so I've just always lived my life of, I'm just gonna shoot for the stars, and I'm gonna shoot a lot of things at the stars because a lot of things won't work. I dreamed of being a concert pianist. Yeah, I'm not good enough. I mean, I, I got pretty, pretty good. I was playing concertos and stuff, but I wasn't that good. I dreamed of being in the Olympics. I didn't make it past high school track, <laughs> you know? So there were lots of things that I dreamed of. It didn't really happen, but I just kept shooting for lots of other things, and I figured something would happen. <laughs> And, and it did, and it did. It just, you know, a lot of things that were very unexpected dreams. So usually, you know, when I, when I talk to kids especially, and especially my own kids, um, I just go, you know what? If a, if, a dream, if a dream fails, not a problem, find a new one. You know, it's not that big of a deal. You just, you just have lots of big dreams out there and keep, keep them big um, because you have, to, you have to really overshoot, overshoot the moon. Go over to the stars, and then you land on the moon. Okay. Fine? Yeah, yeah that's great. Thank you. Okay. Anything that's else you'd good. like to add that we didn't cover? I'd love to hear more about your music, what it was like to be a daughter of a general authority, but you probably Tell you what, if, if we'll take two more minutes, and if you'll okay. help me out here, because I do have to make sure I'm, I'm prepped for, okay. this, for this call. Um, let's see, let's see. Well, what you, you tell me. what. Tell us about your musical background. And you trained, you, you played the Paraguay and harp. Yeah. Did you played the piano um, before that? I grew up playing the piano. My mom was a concert pianist. And so piano was something that we all did. Oh, well, would you let that sound? That's going to be picked up. <laughs> Go away, Gardner. All right, that's probably okay. Um, so I grew up playing the piano, my mom being a concert pianist, she was my first teacher. And then when we moved back here to Salt Lake City, um, I started taking with Susan Duelmeyer, who's the head of piano at the University of Utah. So she got me involved with, with concertos and I just, I just fell in love with that music, Rachmaninoff Concerto Number 2, my favorite. Um, and when I was about 13, I think my dad took me to Paraguay and that's when I fell in love with the Paraguayan harp. I thought, oh, that's such a unique instrument. Why don't I start learning that one too? 
So I, I started uh, when I was about 13 playing the Paraguayan harp. I took um, six months of guitar. I played the trumpet in high school. I was first chair trumpet uh, for the band down in uh, Buenos Aires at the, the, the American School. So we went on all these fun band trips. So it was pretty fun. Um, started taking voice lessons when I was uh, about 17 and um, took maybe 10 years worth of voice lessons. I studied about four different teachers. My first one was uh, um, Joanne Otley with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and she's a good friend of my parents. And um, I've always loved music. A little bit frustrated, though, that I couldn't play what I heard. And I remember watching a movie on the life of Tchaikovsky, and this was down in Buenos Aires. And so it was a Russian film in Spanish subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> which was really interesting for me to go to. But it was one of those cultural things that my parents would do occasionally. We're going to go see this movie on Tchaikovsky. Um, but the music, that concerto number one, oh, that just grabbed me. Um, but in that story of his life, when he was a little boy, he would wake up middle of the night and run downstairs and just bang on the piano, trying to play on the piano what he heard in his head. Eventually, he could do that. But at the time, he couldn't do that. And there's been so many times that I felt that same way, where it's like, oh, I just, I want to compose. I hear this, I hear this, but I don't have the skill set to really translate it. Um, one opportunity where I came very close to doing kind of what I was thinking uh, was when I started, um, I did one album. I, I was studying voice. I was uh, pregnant with my number two daughter when I started taking voice lessons again. And uh, my teacher at the time, he encouraged me to, um, start writing songs again, because I did when I was a teenager, but they weren't really good. And he says, why don't you just start writing songs again? So I, I started, and, and then he encouraged me to produce those three songs. So I did, and then I showed them to Desert Book, and they said, why don't we do a full album? So that was my first album, When All Will Believe, and that, the title song was a song that I wrote. And, um, and it, I loved it, but at the same time, it was extremely frustrating for me because it never quite did the things that I wanted it to do. But then I wrote a second album called Song of the Morning Stars and there were, I'd say about 50% of the music in there was exactly what I heard in my head. The other 50% didn't quite get there. <laughs> and I hear that a lot of uh, artists have that same problem. Um, but it was, it was difficult for me to translate what I heard up here uh, into either piano or orchestra. And so I really, I haven't written since then. It's been about 10 years. Um, I, I'd love to get back into it again, but um, but I realized how hard it was. It just didn't come easy. And, and, I, and I see so many artists who are just so much more talented than I am. So that's also intimidating. You know, they've got the skill set to actually do it. And you know, who am I to, to do that? But, but I appreciate music. I love music, um, all different kinds of music. Um, like I said, Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky are my, two of my favorites. Um, but then, you know, I love I love Harry Connick Jr. and I love um, Andrea Bocelli and just a whole wide variety. Every now and then, my daughters get me listening to country music, and so I get into that. And, <laughs> and it's just fun. I love Latin music, just across the board. Okay. Oh boy, you used up so much of your time. No, I appreciate it. Sorry, I have to, no to run off. We've got, I, I've been out of town since last sure. night. 